So with that, it's time to turn to our substantive program. It's my, my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the moderator of the uh, first substantive panel today on search warrants and taint teams, reexamining the process of defending clients in a digital age for searches and seizures. As I mentioned earlier, Rob Terry has been very generous with his time in support of this program, and he is the moderator of this panel today. Rob is a member of a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's a partner at Williams and Connolly, a graduate of the University of Virginia Law School. But Rob is most noted as a trial attorney. Recently, in August of this year, he successfully represented uh, Joseph Astorita, a former uh, FBI or FBI agent accused uh, in the uh, shooting of Lavoie Finicum of making false statements to the government um, and found not guilty of those charges. Rob, of course, played an integral part of the defense of Senator Ted Stevens in his trial and later authored the book Not Guilty, The Unlawful Prosecution of U.S. Senator Ted Stevens, uh, which has been uh, widely praised uh, uh, by uh, both prosecutors and defense lawyers for examining weaknesses in uh, the federal system of prosecution. So with that, Rob, Thank you again for your help on this program and for moderating this panel. Thank, thanks so much. So um, our first topic today is uh, ripped from the headlines. On um, April 9th, the FBI executed search warrants at the um, <coughs> Rockefeller Center offices of the law firm Squire Sanders Patent Boggs. Um, on, they also executed a search warrant at the um, office or, or at, the, at a hotel room at the Regency Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. And as if that weren't high profile enough, it turns out that those rooms, the office was rented or used by, by the president's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. And uh, I thought that that was a, a very good launching point to talk about uh, some of the issues that um, got a lot of news coverage but have been part of our practice, uh, and that is the use of taint teams and search warrants and, and, and subpoenas and how to handle that in an electronic age. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, on our panel, we have um, Jamila Hall, who's a former assistant U.S. attorney here in Atlanta. Uh, she was involved in many white-collar crime prosecutions, including one in her final year in the office for which she received a national award uh, as the best consumer protection prosecution in the United States. She's a graduate of Columbia Law School. She's now a partner at Jones Day, where she's very involved in the bar on a local, state, national level, and is a leader in the Atlanta business community, has won many awards for her uh, civic involvement. Uh, we also have Gary Neftalis, who um, is a former assistant U.S. attorney in New York and is, by all accounts, uh, the consensus choice is the dean of the New York uh, White Collar Crime Bar. He's had many famous cases over the years, including the, the, the Disney battle and uh, representing, for example, the, um, the founder of um, Studio 54 in a tax evasion case. But the, the, the famous case he's, that's most relevant for us today is he was the special master in the case of Lynn Stewart, who was a lawyer uh, several years ago indicted for uh, conspiring with terrorists, and, and he handled the, um, the privilege issues that arose in that case. Uh, Danny Griffin's also a former assistant U.S. attorney here in Atlanta a few years before uh, Jamila. He's a, a double dog. He uh, graduated from the University of Georgia with honors in, in both his bachelor and law degrees. He's a partner at Miller Martin in Atlanta, and uh, he has had many great victories, including one in which he achieved something that I dare say many of us, I know I never will, have ever achieved, which is an apology from the U.S. attorney after, after a case was indicted. Finally, we've got Mark Ray, who is a former special agent with the FBI in its cyber division. He has a bachelor's in management, information management from Purdue and an MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's the managing director and, and head of the cyber digital and cybersecurity practice at Nordello and Company, one of our sponsors. He brings great technological uh, uh, knowledge to our panel. And, and I must say, uh, he also has a great ability to dismiss, demystify that knowledge and explain it to us in, uh, in terms we can all understand, which is uh, very helpful to me and, and others. 
so to begin, I'd like to start with the Dean of the White Collar Crime Bar in New York City, Gary, and ask you for some historical perspective. And setting aside sort of the sensational nature of the Cohen uh, search warrant, which was on a, a, a lawyer, which makes it especially extraordinary, have you observed any trends in terms of the, the frequency with which, with which prosecutors are using search warrants as opposed to subpoenas in white collar cases? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, you call the dean, it means that uh, it, it means you get uh, half price on the subway <laughs> because of your age. Uh, the look, I, I, I think uh, there really is an increase in search warrants, at least in my experience, my anecdotal experience. Way, you know, way back when, <clears throat> when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, you never use search warrants in white collar cases. You use search warrants in drug cases, organized crime cases, uh, traditional crime cases. I think that over the years, uh, the use of search warrants has really expanded uh, in white collar cases. And I think prosecutors sort of feel, I think you, you, the feedback you get is, they're impatient with uh, the delays in production, especially now with, because uh, the document, documents are so much greater because of electronic communications. I mean, used to be there was a file cabinet of documents, that was your case. Now you have all these computers and, it, and, and all, the, all the like. So I think there's a big I increase. In addition, under the Stored Communications Act, Section 2703A, if the emails, the content, are 180 degrees young or less, you have to proceed by search warrant. And of course, that, that whole business is, is, is moved, uh, the whole business of white collar pr uh, crime practice into a different era. Uh, Jamil, you were the most recent prosecutor on our panel today. What um, considerations might a prosecutor use in deciding whether to go the traditional route that Gary described of issuing a subpoena or, or um, executing a search warrant? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we're seeing more frequently and I certainly saw in the office is um, about an air compliance. And so where you have uh, perhaps some concerns that you might get compliance that Gary is referring to where there were actual dialogues and uh, more sharing of information, uh, the search warrant, the element of surprise with the search warrant is something that's going to be more useful to a prosecutor's office. Also, there are just things that are not, um, that don't come to mind when you are responding to a request for documents that are great for law enforcement to be able to capture. So in thinking about electronic data, for example, you have voicemails, you have text messages, you have chat messages that are happening um, on, on computers that are much easier for law enforcement to think about and capture than attorneys that are responding to requests for production of documents. And so in this day and age, when you've got so multiple mediums, it's actually probably to a prosecutor's benefit to um, use a search warrant. And I think it's that sort of fear of lack of compliance um, that you oftentimes see the search warrant being used. So Mark, um, you were with the FBI and cyber. Can you explain to us the process that the FBI undertakes when they execute a search warrant in today's world? When I, when I started, they would go in and look at documents and um, uh, you know, choose some files that were covered by the warrant, others not covered by the warrant. How, how does it work today? Well, um, certainly with the right authority, um, a lot of it can be done remotely. Uh, very rare are the cases where um, FBI agents or other law enforcement are going into a data center or into an office and pulling servers off of a rack or computers out from under desks. Yes, it still happens, but um, I believe the majority of the electronic search warrants or subpoenas that are served today are done remotely without a, an agent or a prosecutor ever stepping foot in a, an office or talking to an internet service provider. It's a, uh, a document's uploaded to a portal. The, the service provider um, uh, produces the data and it's, and it's served back electronically. So um, it is, uh, it, and it's still evolving. I think the process is still evolving as we've seen with the Cloud Act this year, um, where I think both you know, the private sector, the public sector, um, and the legal community are trying to figure out um, how, do we, how do we properly you know, produce information uh, at the request of the government without overproducing or protecting attorney-client privilege. So I think it's still evolving. Um, and 
but uh, most of it is, uh, yes, you know, it, the, the ability exists to reach out remotely and seize evidence, uh, just like the IT administrators from your firm can push out patches on your computer without you knowing. Um, you know, service providers or the government, again, with the right authority, can do that uh, without ever touching foot or setting foot in an office. So let me follow up on that a little bit. The Cloud Act is a result of the um, Microsoft case before the Supreme Court where Microsoft objected to uh, producing documents pursuant to a warrant that were actually housed on a server in Ireland on, on the grounds that it was beyond the, 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 the um, jurisdiction of the United States. And how, uh, and it was rendered moot by the Cloud Act, which was a, mint, which was a, 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 um, a rider on the um, appropriations bill. And how, how did it change what, what you see, Ray? What, what does the, or Mark, what does the, the, what's the Cloud Act provide? Well, I think certainly for the government, um, uh, you know, even just up, up to a few years ago, um, you know, we've had, everyone knows about traditionally computer forensics or forensic accounting in the forensics world, but now we have this new practice or discipline called cloud forensics, which is, you know, data lives in multiple places. Um, a, a, a special agent or, a, you know, a, or even in a civil matter may serve a subpoena for an email account um, or a, uh, a website and the contents um, the database may be on one server in Ireland, and the other scripts or, or pieces of the code may reside in the United States. Um, and the Cloud Act says, look, to the provider, um, whatever's in the four corners of this warrant or the subpoena, you must provide it to us regardless of jurisdiction. So, uh, Danny, um, I, I know you have some memories of what it was like to execute a search warrant, have a search warrant executed when you were an assistant U.S. attorney. How is that differ uh, from from uh, the way it's done today? And in, in particular, did you have any experience with lawyers' um, offices being um, uh, searched? Well, I do, and so now I'm getting old enough where I can tell you back in the day. we I was involved in a search of a lawyer's office where they had a computer and we didn't take it. It was like 20 years ago. There's a number of people in this room in who had clients in this, but there was a, you know, a staged accident ring. The investigations first started because lawyers, personal injury lawyers would pay runners to bring them cases and they paid cash. And so it was a tax case and it turned out, uh, it was learned that the runners just found it easier, don't find real cases, just stage accidents. They could find people with cruddy cars who would bang them up. They pay the driver in advance, they pay for uh, the insurance on the car, and there would be five and six people in each car. But the accident wouldn't occur. The runners would bang the cars in, and 11 people would get back in the car. The police would be called. Everybody had neck injuries, back injuries. Anyway, one car would go to one lawyer and one chiropractor. The lawyer was fronting all of the cash, and the other car would go to another one. We uh, interviewed the legal assistant, the lawyer knew he was under investigation, so, you know, a practice tip here. If the legal assistant is being asked, where are the files stored, how are they stored, <laughs> and things like that, you, I think you can expect a search. So that, the basic parameters of how you get a search warrant, I think, are the same. You've got to, the assistant U.S. attorney's got to talk to the U.S. attorney, you've got to get permission from, an, uh, from Washington, has to consult with the criminal division, has to talk about, well, if we do this search, uh, here's how we're going to avoid uh, looking at privileged material, and when we gather it all, we're going to have a tank team, and here's a plan, and all of that. That's what we did in that case. Again, we skipped the computer. We just went to the hard files, and then the next question was, you know, how do you do it? We, ha we came to an agreement with the defense counsel about how the tank review would work, so we didn't have to get into that battle. But circling back to your original comment about search warrants themselves, I, I represent a lot of individuals, and I have found that search warrants are much more common now for various reasons. And Gary and I, we were involved in a case where I think a top five privately held company was raided, pi pilot travel centers was uh, subject of a search, so it's not just little people. This was, they had their reasons. They thought that the company had discovered that they were under investigation and they thought that there was some bad activity to cover things up, so they conducted a search, but it was a massive raid, massive. 
So uh, Jamila, let me ask you this. So Danny's just talked about a massive uh, raid. Um, if you were to get a call from your, a corporate client of yours, says we're being raided right now, and let's assume it's the quaint notion where it's not being done remotely, but right. it's actually, they're actually showing up at the office, and, and, and it's taking place in real time. Perhaps this is a longstanding client of, of, of your firm that, that you didn't even know was under investigation. What's, what's your first response? Well, Rob, because we're Jones Day, we're, we're always prepared, first of all, so. <laughs> um, no, so let's get to before the phone call. Before the phone call, um, one of the things that I think are important for law firms and for corporations to be considerate of are their document retention policies. I think we lawyers love stuff, and we love to have paper and files and all of that, but if but if your office gets raided and you don't have a document retention policy, all that stuff's gonna end up in the government's hands and, um, and then you'll have to deal with it after the fact. So before the phone call is even coming, we're talking to our clients about their document retention policies to make sure that they only have what they need in the event that there is a raid. But it, when there is one or if there is one, there are a few things that we um, always advise and that's to make sure that nobody obstructs you know, just let, let them do what they need to do. Make sure you get a copy of the warrant. And if you think that they're going outside the bounds of the warrant, say something, but don't do anything. Just, say, you know, say to the agent, oh, looks like, you know, that closet wasn't included in the warrant. Um, we'll deal with it on the back end. Um, and then there's a question of employees. Uh, of course, the agents are going to want to talk to the employees. And you, again, don't want to obstruct. You don't instruct the employees not to cooperate. They can do whatever it is at their, their will. Um, you can, of course, provide attorney counsel for them if they'd like to have that. But it's, it's mostly getting through that point uh, in time and not providing any substantive information as law enforcement is doing what it needs to do. But I can't stress enough how many times we go into our clients' offices to do what we call dawn raid tra training because it's especially overseas, there are a lot more of these raids by the tax authorities. And you'll see the recycling bin overflowing with paper, you know, and the, the um, shred bin is unlocked and there's tons of paper in there. Those are the types of things that you can mention to your clients just as a protocol compliance perspective that can really help them if they are subject to these types of raids. And do you have any advice for companies with international operations in terms of uh, different risk profile depending upon where, where they have offices? Well, it, it, it really is quite dependent. Um, I'm sure everybody here remembers last year, Jones Day itself was subject to a raid in Munich. Um, and uh, we were all shocked and, and immediately thought, oh, that's never going to stand up. Uh, just earlier this year, the German courts, uh, and this is related to the VW emissions investigation, uh, the, the German authorities raided Jones Day's offices because we had done the internal investigation of, of, of VW. Um, and of course, our first priority was that most of those documents in the investigation were privileged. Well, in, in, in Germany, uh, the courts held that we are a foreign law firm conducting an internal investigation. And so those records were in fact not privileged. Um, and so that's something that we have now clarity on, but certainly uh, creates a, a concern for everybody that's got foreign operations or, or, or law firms operating overseas. Uh, you do have GDPR and other privacy considerations that I think foreign authorities are kind of hip to, but what we'll be talking about down the line, Rob, in terms of intermediaries to protect companies are the same things that we'd be looking to try to implement overseas as well. Uh, Mark, um, what sort of notice might a, um, a company or an individual get? How would you learn that the FBI has done a remote, uh, by, by the way, I want to note for the record, I, I, I made a note for myself not to call these raids, to call them execution, execution of search warrants. Um, <laughs> all, all my clients always call them raids, and I'm, I'm glad all the <laughs> former law enforcement people up here are calling them raids. Uh, so, so let's say it's, it's one of these, it's a remote <laughs> guerrilla raid on, on, um, on, say, an internet service provider of you know, your Yahoo accounts. How, how, is, is, uh, how would I, as a lawyer, for an individual or a company, know that that has happened? 
it's, it's actually been a topic of a lot of debate. Um, there's a process within the federal government to, um, you know, to request um, and sometimes to compel the, uh, the provider not to, um, not to reveal the presence or the existence of the warrant or the subpoena. Um, I'll be honest, that has mixed results from my experience. Um, sometimes they comply, sometimes they don't. And um, let me try to, uh, you mentioned my job was to demystify the tech. Let me actually speak to that for a second because that's a big part of it. The technology exists in this world of electronic search warrants or seizing digital evidence both ways. It, it, it exists to be able to really refine and target the collection or the, the production of the, of the material, meaning like to narrow it down to certain time frames or certain names on an email. The technology also exists for um, to wrap up a company's entire um, Microsoft Exchange email server on a thumb drive and provide it to the government. So it's kind of scary. Um, and I think as what you should uh, represent to your client or help your clients understand is you really need to look at the provider that's in in question here for individuals for talking about social media accounts the facebook's the yahoo's linkedin's look that just based on experience it's going to be a much better experience for your clients meaning they're go they are going to push back on the government they're not just going to turn over everything to the government um there's been some interesting case law last year um u.s versus blake and i think it was the 11th district out in California um, shot down or co considered a Facebook subpoena of the FBI unconstitutional. Um, they said, no, this is over collection. You need to be more specific. So um, the larger providers um, th probably are going to work in the uh, defense of the privacy of the individual. Um, speaking from experience, some of the smaller internet service providers, especially if we talk overseas, look, they just received a subpoena from, or a search warrant from the government. They may have never experienced that before, and they may just do this and turn it over. And I have actually received that. You know, you, you're, you're, a lot of these, especially in clouds, the cloud forensics, were, as I mentioned earlier, um, there could be hundreds, if not thousands, of individual virtual servers on one physical server. and. Uh, the provider may not do the diligence to sift through that, and they may just turn that over. So it's um, it, it cuts both ways. And um, but in terms of the notification, um, if it, if it was if the government didn't request that it be concealed, maybe they would get notified. But certainly, if you get involved as lo as uh, the firm representing your client, um, definitely that the matter even exists uh, to start asking questions. There's no requirement that the individual gets notified that. They're the information is being requested. I think it depends on the provider for the most part. And, um, and again, there, I think there are you know, certain, um, certain vehicles that allow the government to prevent that uh, or request that the notification uh, not occur, like on an email search warrant, for example. So Mark, our own headline here is that we've got to re re rely on Facebook to protect our privacy, our client's privacy? <laughs> Well, they're certainly under fire, uh, as, as we know right now in the news, to, to, uh, to help um, the government and the public understand how they're doing that. But I think uh, more and more they will err on the side of not uh, over-providing. You know, Rob, my, uh, Mark may be more knowledgeable about this than I, but I've gotten these notifications, but they're like six months later, nine months later, a year later that, that uh, Facebook or some social media site uh, or email site has been, uh, you know, has provided information. That's and who, who gave you the notice, Gary? Was it, was it the, the provider or was it uh, the government? It was the government, ultimately, but it was quite late. But yeah. So, uh, Gary, Danny mentioned a taint team. What, 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 give us some, some historical perspective on a taint team. Uh, what's it been over the years? What is it today? And then I like to ask everybody about their experience with taint teams. Well, taint teams or filter teams, as they call them, I think that's, the, that's a new way of describing them. I've also heard them called a clean team. Clean team, yeah, I think, I think marketing is everywhere. Uh, <laughs> the, the taint team is, is uh, assistant U.S. attorneys and, and uh, sometimes with government agents, FBI agents or others, who are completely unconnected to the substantive prosecution of the case, and they are brought in, uh, and they have nothing to do with the, the prosecution of the case, and to, they're brought in to examine documents that have been seized or obtained uh, to see what's privileged and what isn't privileged, and to make the uh, and to make the judgments on that. Uh, the theory of, of that is that therefore. 
the privilege isn't compromised, uh, going back to the original aim, taint that the investigation of prosecution isn't tainted. Uh, this is a, you know, at least in my experience, relatively new, uh, because their researches didn't happen all that uh, way back when all that much, and you didn't have emails and the like, and the quantity of documents is so much greater, and the use of warrants and the like is so much greater, but this is the government's answer to making sure that privileged documents are not utilized and the investigation isn't tainted and then there's a ground for the defense to throw out the indictment or uh, take other remedial action. Uh, taint teams, at least in, in my experience, are used quite all the time. I mean, uh, the government, have, you, you hear about it all the time and, and you talk to the, uh, and, and you end up having conversations and communications with that lawyer uh, about matters and, uh, and that's who you deal with on it. And allegedly there's no communications other than of the most antiseptic nature on the, on the substance between the taint team and the prosecutors actually handling the trial of the case or the investigation. So Gary, do you, do you trust taint teams to do their jobs correctly? Look, I, I think for the most part they do do their jobs correctly. Uh, I mean, I don't, look, you know, you can always think of some one bad example or, or the other, but look, and, and you know, the issue is how they interpret privilege. And uh, are they going to take an expansive view, a restrictive view? How, how hard are they going to be? Look, you can argue that one both ways. You know, and, and it's like everything else in the criminal law system. It depends on who you're dealing with, right? I mean, some people, you, know, you can find uh, people on taint teams who are, you know, take a very restrictive view of what's privileged and what isn't privileged. In that case, you would prefer they not be doing it. You'd prefer uh, a special master or some independent figure. On the other hand, the one argument in favor of them is if you have really good people on a taint team, they may well be really concerned about not messing up the case and, and having something turned over. And they might actually be better for you on the defense side than a special master would be. They might take a more, you know, I don't think, you know, I think we should play this one safe and not turn this over. Again, but as I say, that's, everything is quite individual. Um, and I, I, you've sort of anticipated my next question, but I understand that you are generally, as I am, trustworthy with good faith of the people that are doing it, but what do your clients who are being investigated think when you tell them, okay, here's the way it's gonna work. Somebody down the hall who works, reports to the same boss ultimately is gonna be reviewing the documents and they will filter through what the people who are out to put you in jail uh, are actually gonna see. How does that go over? Well, I think the general reaction of clients is, I was born at night, but not last night. <laughs> and uh, I think they have a much higher degree of skepticism, uh, generally about the government, which is, which is reasonable. After all, they're the ones who are facing the end of their lives as a practical matter. They're angry at the government. They don't like the, what the government's doing. They, they think it's all unfair. and. Et cetera. So they, oh, they take a much more skeptical view of it than, than lawyers who are much more into the system and, and know, how, you know how the balls and strikes are called by the umpires. One so, of the things, uh, uh, Rob, one of the things I think um, to, to Gary's point is because you, can, you sometimes have access to the taint teams and if you are doing a parallel review of the materials and, and sort of come up with things that might be tricky privilege issues, you can bring those to the taint team and have a conversation. They might not always agree with you, but at least there is a, a, a dialogue that you might be able to have and, and give your clients some comfort and have some comfort in the process. So that's, that's a difference from being able to you know, have the direct flow with the prosecutors, which might not be there. So Jamil has given us excellent advice on what to do sort of in anticipation of a, of a raid, uh, what to do the minute you find out that there's been a raid. Uh, now I want to sort of move to the day after when the dust settles a little bit. You know your client has been raided uh, and um, the, the 
a night passes and it's the next morning, and Danny, what are your steps, or what are the, what, what's the spectrum of possibilities to advocate for your client once the, the FBI has come in and either taken the servers or you find out that there's been some sort of a, a remote seizure of electronic data? What sorts of things are you talking about doing now, then? I don't know about the remote seizure. I don't know what the remedies are, if there are any, immediately. But, you know, if there's been a search of a lawyer's office on day one, that afternoon or the very next day, you've been hired, just pick up the phone. The first thing you want to do is to get access to what has been taken. If the, if the computer has been taken, that's how you run your business. That's really what you're concerned about, is you want to get that back. I, I think in Atlanta, you know, you can have these conversations and come to a pretty quick agreement about get this thing mirror image and return it to the, the person. Sometimes it takes a while. But what we're looking for is equity. And there's some been some recent cases. There was a case just left, not even a month ago in Tucson, a lawyer named Rafael Gallego, uh, he had his office searched and he filed the very next day, um, uh, an emergency motion for a temporary restraining order. And the facts, according to Raphael, were he, he got arrested too. So he was arrested as he was walking into a state courthouse for day two of a trial he was in. And according to his facts, the FBI used a battering ram to knock down his unlocked office door and then held his secretary on the ground under gunpoint for 90 minutes. And they took all every all of his computers out of his office. So he filed a, a motion for TRO, and you know he had, he had some pretty good stuff in there. But think about it. What you're saying is you got to get the court to exercise, you know, some equitable powers here. And what he asked for is an immediate order that all seized items be made available to the defense to review in the first instance and that all responsive non-privileged items would then be disclosed to the government. He asked that a special master be appointed to oversee the defense's review of the seized documents and that the government be restrained from reviewing any of the seized documents pending a ruling on the special master. And that he also, and this is a good point too, if you're a lawyer you want this, is, is to keep under seal the search warrant itself and all the, invent the search warrant inventory, so any materials associated with the search. The court only took a day. A day later, the court did a, a, a rule on this and just stayed, basically stayed everything, ordered the government to mirror image the computers and give the computers back, took under advisement the request for a special master, and also told the government you can't even, you cannot copy or review any documents until I see what's in there. Now, the government came back and said, we've got a tank team, this is done all the time. Uh, we will review the documents in the first instance. And their plan was anything that's not privileged, we'll turn over to the prosecutors. If it's clearly privileged, we'll put it in a barrel. And if it's on the fence or it might be subject to the crime fraud, exception, we'll put it in another barrel for, and they were seemed to be okay at the end with a special master, but they, the government really wanted to make these determinations by itself at first. So it's pending. We don't know what ha what's happened. So uh, I think I'll use that as a segue to talk about the Cohen case, because Michael Cohen uh, took somewhat the same approach that this lawyer in Arizona did, and, and it's my thesis that, the, that we're going to see a trend of more people doing that. Um, the, the warrant in the Cohen case was executed on April 9th. Um, his um, office is at Squire Sanders, Pat Boggs, and I, I guess I should emphasize he had a, um, a strategic alliance with them. He was really just using office space. That's a relationship that has since been terminated. And uh, his hotel, um, I believe his former office, which I think was his, his residence, which was being remodeled, was raided. It's so liberating to be able to use the word raid now. <laughs> uh, his uh, and then and then uh, they took a number of devices, uh, Blackberries, cell phones, and um, speaking to your point about shredded documents, how you see documents that haven't been shredded, they actually took uh, shredded documents that had been shredded and, and reassembled them, I, I believe, in, or in in, in, the, in the Michael Cohen case. So just because it's been shredded doesn't mean it can't be put back together by the F by our friends at the FBI. Uh, Cohen uh, quickly moved for a TRO. I've um, not been able to 
find that online if um, anybody has access to it. I'd, I'd love to love to see it. And I'm going to leave some time. I think this is a real iterative. Um, if anybody has questions as we go along at the end, I'll leave plenty of time for questions because I'm very interested in everybody else's experience in this area as well. But he uh, filed for a TRO, basically saying, um, as I understand from the government's response, the documents should be returned to me, and I should be able to uh, review them for privilege, much as one would do if you received a subpoena for, for documents. Um, the government's response uh, responded a few days later, in which they said, uh, first of all, we haven't looked at anything yet. Um, they said that the warrants at issue expressly provided that they, quote, shall be conducted pursuant to established procedures designed to collect evidence in a manner reasonably designed to protect any attorney, client, or other applicable privilege, end of quote. They also invited the government, or invited Cohen, to offer suggestions on how the case might be improved, the, the, the iterative process I think that everybody is recommending here, and then also asked Cohen, uh, will you give us a list of your clients? And then we can, our tank team will work better if you give us a list of your clients. Uh, which Cohen uh, declined to do. Who on this panel thinks that was a fair question to ask of, of Michael Cohen? And I understand he may have had fewer clients than most of us, but uh, was that a fair question, Gary, to ask? Give us a list of all your clients. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was pretty aggressive myself. I mean, I look, you know, as a technical matter, the identity of your clients aren't, isn't privileged, you know, unless it discloses the communication. Um, so technically, you can't claim privilege over it, but I thought that was pretty a, a pretty aggressive tactic, and and I thought the, the Cohen was right in trying to resist it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I certainly would have taken that kind of position because you know your clients are your clients. I don't think you know what everyone thinks of Sean Hannity. I'm not so thoroughly <laughs> sure that he liked the idea of his name being broadcast all over the world as a client of Michael Combs. Um, and it seemed to me that I, I, I come down on the defense side on that one. Jamel, what do you think? You know, the, the more interesting point to me on that, because I agree with Gary, and I thought that it is rather aggressive, um, although I'm not sure what, how well for the team team to filter, because um, you can't really give keywords for an attorney that had a client base like Colin. Um, but I wonder if the agents that executed the search have been re recused from the, the subsequent prosecution because the way that his files must have been arranged in such sort of disarray, um, I think that those agents likely saw things that while they were gathering that could arguably have been privileged. And I don't know that that's a question we really, um, we really attack often is what are the agents that are executing the search and making determinations as to whether something actually falls within the boundaries of the warrant? Um, yep. Are they seeing things that are, you know, breach the privilege, and are they still then allowed to be part of that, that team? Given how, given how few clients Cohen had, and the fact that he ended up making a, a, you know, a plea arrangement sort of the issue goes away, but I think Jamil's point is right. In, in a case which is going to be contested and with, with a lawyer who, has, who he or she has scores of clients, also some of whom may be criminal right. representations in, in, with that office, which uh, it strikes, and some of them may be criminal representations where the government doesn't even know that you're the lawyer for that person or that that person ha is concerned enough about a representation that he or she needs counsel. Right, and I would just add that the, the, the right. rules of professional conduct go beyond what is privileged. So just because it's not privileged or inadmissible in court doesn't mean it's not a confidence or secret that needs to be kept, kept uh, confidential pursuant to the ethical rules. Mark, does, can technology provide any solutions to, to these uh, difficult issues? Um. Yes and no. Um, yes, from what I mentioned pre uh, earlier, that um, you know whether it's especially when we talk about individuals' emails or um, things of that nature, they can be refined by keywords or dates, things like that. Um, tr traditional e-discovery practices that you all are familiar with. But you know, one thing that I think is important to note and a, a, <clears throat> a good takeaway is um, the the concept of we talked. You mentioned at the beginning, Rob, right? Like 
the old days, sure, here come a bunch of agents and blue jackets walking out with boxes from an office. And then we just talked about the issue of like kind of these remote uh, or uh, uh, you know serving of warrants and uh, seizing of information. But you know the one thing we really didn't talk about is is these things, right? And um, you know the cell phones and mobile devices and you know talk, seizing ser uh, servers and email accounts is one thing, but the types of cases we're talking about here, the real juicy stuff, as we know, is on here, right? It's the it's the app that's be only being used by 13-year-olds in middle school and CEOs trying to hide something um, that's not going to be in the email server or you know in the corporate records. Um, that's the challenge here. And so, but one thing I do I think is a big takeaway that I'd like to mention is that um, uh, I. For the most part, the technology doesn't exist to um, limit what is imaged on a phone. There's no, uh, we're only going to image from June 22nd forward. No, you image the whole phone or nothing. So be aware of that and advise your clients that I have a case right now. Uh, just use a practical example. Uh, the government came in with a search warrant for, uh, for a physical location, including the electronic devices, to include mobile devices. Um, they come and what's called dump the phone. Um, that is a full image of the phone, all, everything that's on there. Um, so even if their warrant only says communications with X, Y, and Z on these dates or these particular words, they have everything. Be aware of that. Um, uh, just again, practical matter, uh, and I hope this, if this helps, there's uh, the client right now with their law firm uh, is in negotiations with the prosecutor, with the agents, with the, the CDC. The, I don't know if you, many of you know, I see Vic Hartman in the background there, just going to call him out, the former uh, chief division, division counsel or general counsel of the local FBI division that was responsible for that search warrant. Um, there, there is negotiations that occur to say, hey, here's all the attorney names you need to consider. All of this is attorney-client privilege. So when it comes to these mobile devices and more and more stuff is almost everything is on them, right, both personal and work, um, there's a lot, it's a lot harder to, to uh, use the technology to carve out what's privileged, what's not. Um, the government claimed in its opposition to the TR motion that the um, Second Circuit has, quote, repeatedly found that the government's use of a filter team appropriately protects applicable privileges, end of quote. Um, I saw a number of decisions cited, and I think I saw a number of Southern District decisions cited. I didn't see a Second Circuit decision. Has the Second Circuit, Gary, uh, your home circuit, expressly approved the use of taint teams? Not to my knowledge. I don't think the issue has actually ever been ruled on by the Second Circuit. There are a raft of district court cases, but I, I, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any Second Circuit case that's dealt with. How about the Eleventh Circuit, Danny? I, I don't know of any. I, I would point out that our Tucson defendant argued that all these district court cases out of the Second Circuit, they are not law firm cases. They're individuals who've communicated with their lawyers. I mean, now, that, except for maybe Stewart, and, but he, he was arguing that these cases are really clients who were arguing about it, not the law firm or the lawyer. By the way, that's a, that's a really good point, and, and uh, the um, the president then intervened in the case. Uh, Joanna Hendon of New York City uh, uh, represented him and, and filed papers talking about the importance of the privilege. And they said what the government, she wrote that what the government was suggesting uh, was actually unprecedented in this circuit. And the big distinction she drew is that this is a lawyer's office that's being raided and all the other cases uh, were actually not lawyer's offices. But I, I would actually posit that the same issues arise with every corporate client because Jamila, you're your communications with, with any of your corporate clients are likely to be picked up in this computer um, computer seizure, or the ESI seizure. Mark, right? There's no way to exclude that when they have an initial sure. image, right? And um, so I, I think many of the issues, although this is a lawyer case, a lawyer office that was raided, I think it applies to lots of, uh, lots of our other situations as well. One of the things that government pointed out is that the um, U.S. Attorney, that, that they were applying procedures consistent with the U.S. Attorney's Manual. And, um, but then they go on later in their brief to say that the U.S. Attorney's Manual is not intended to, does not, may not be relied upon to create any rights, substantive or procedural, that are enforceable at law by any party in any manner, civil or criminal. Uh, my question for anybody in the panel is, what's the U.S. Attorney's Manual say about, I think they call them privilege teams, and uh, of what benefit is that to us when we're in court. Danny, you got it there? Well, I've got a couple. I mean, when it comes to these review teams, it's not any one, it's not 
one size fits all. There's a lot of different suggestions. You know, it, it's they want the U.S. Attorney's Office to consider who's going to conduct the review: a privileged team, a judicial officer, or a special master. So, in the U.S. U.S. Attorney's Manual itself. It doesn't just say the prosecution gets to set up its own tank team. It says you've got to consider there's various alternatives. Now, are you going to get any relief? Yeah, how much success have you had in court citing the U.S. Attorney's Manual? No, I, everybody's talking like, I, I think if you negotiate, though, that you can get somewhere. You have to because somebody's going to look at this. I think the best solution would be the defense and, and the tank team review at the same time. Now, how you do that with a massive amount of computer data, I don't know. I don't know how you can dump that on a special master. Right. Mark, you got any ideas there? Yeah, it, it's hard because we're, it's, you're, again, you're all these, the answer, man. I know, all these devices hold more and more data, and yes, and, and like I, I'm, it, literally, a company, this entire, uh, you know, email or corporate servers can fit on a thumb drive, so um, it would require, and some of these reviews can, can take, you know, months, if not years. So you're putting a lot of burden on a team like that um, to go through and know what is privileged, what is not. So um, again, the extent that, you know, keyword searches or time frames, usually from my experience, the time frames, um, that's one area that where the technology can certainly help is carving out, okay, only these files on, on these uh, systems were, um, were accessed or created beyond, you know, between these dates. So that's probably the best tool uh, at everyone's disposal right now. So Judge uh, Wood ordered a set of the seized materials produced back to Michael Cohen and then asked Cohen and the President's lawyers whether they had the resources to review the materials for privilege and to produce the documents uh, deemed privileged to a special master. And Cohen's lawyers wrote back and said, we have a, uh, the Discovery Center at the McDermott Will Law Firm and we're well equipped to do this. And the President's lawyers was with a smaller firm and said, we've, we've talked to lots of vendors and, and we think we can do that as well. Uh, the government then weighed in and proposed a compromise, which was that the uh, special master would directly review the seized material assisted by technology-assisted uh, te technology review to identify potentially privileged uh, materials. And I, I believe there was a letter that Judge Wood may have solicited from um, um, former magistrate Judge Moss, who talked about how technologically-assisted review could help make this process a lot more efficient. Um, Judge Wood then said, um, the letters that I received from counsel for Mr. Cohen and the interveners, that's actually the Trump and the Trump Organization, have convinced me that this process can go quickly with a special master, assuming everyone works as hard as you have representing you will work. And as I've said before, I view a taint team to be fair as one done by a good special master. I'm agreeing with the government and counsel that a special master <coughs> makes sense at this point. So they actually were talking together and, uh, and, and agreed perhaps for the reasons that um, I think, Gary, you suggested that the government's worried about their record on appeal, they want to make sure that, that they're, they're protecting the record, and they agreed to a, to a special master. Uh, Judge Wood went on to say, notwithstanding that I think we all know that the Southern District prosecutors have integrity and decency and could do, can do the job with utmost integrity. So she goes to bat for the Southern District uh, office, but also says we'll use a special master in this case. Uh, they appointed, um, uh, retired Judge Barbara Jones to, to, to the job, who said I can devote 90% of my time to it. Uh, Judge Wood says there's no need to prepare a privilege log. Uh, I think that has come to be viewed as very wasteful of time because they seldom contain enough information to be useful. And what she asked instead was that the documents um, be produced, that the Cohen, uh, Cohen's lawyers review the documents, determine which ones are potentially privileged, then give them to the privilege holders for them to decide what is privileged and what not, and then she left it to the special master. And from what I can tell, there was very little controversy after that. Now it may have, it may be some of, um, impact that the, that Cohen uh, apparently decided to cooperate about 80 percent of the way through this process. But the interveners are there as well, and um, at the end of the day. Um, the special master charged, uh, she submitted four bills, $47,338,368,000, $296,000, which I, if my math's right, is a little more than a million dollars. Uh, it's unclear from the record who paid for that, but it, the, the, this suggests, Gary, do you know who paid for that? <coughs> I, I think uh, my, my understanding is that half was paid for by the government and half was paid for by uh, Cohn and, uh, and, and Trump. Um, 
divided that up somehow, the other half. And um, who, pay, who paid for your, when you were the special master in Barbara Stewart's case, who paid, or in um, Lynn Stewart's case, who paid for your uh, Well, in, 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 my, in, my, in my case, when I was appointed, uh, Judge Codal's order said that the, the government should pay for the entire uh, bill. It was kind of interesting. What, what happened is shortly after I was asked to do this, uh, what the, one of the prosecutors, who uh, a very good guy, happened to be the son of a very well-known white-collar defense lawyer and a good friend of mine, called me up and he said, I've been asked, and he very sheepishly, <laughs> he said, I've been asked by the U.S. attorney, would you waive your fee and do this oh. for free? <laughs> So I said to this fellow, a great guy who I knew from when he was this high until, and I said, have you, t have you asked your father about this request? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, because he would be appalled. <laughs> I knew he was making this request. That was the end of the conversation. <laughs> and did the, gov the government pay your your back rates for that? Uh, no, they, I ended up having to give them a discount, uh, you know, the, uh, dealing with some sort of administrative person there who was yeah. crying about how this was going to destroy the budget of the United States. I didn't think my bill was that high. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know if Cohen got a subpoena too? <laughs> see, see, I've always thought it was somewhat humorous. First of all, the most exciting time I found is when know you're doing a search for the agents is to do a search warrant that's a very exciting thing to do but I've been in, I've gotten involved in search warrants where then there was no subpoena that asked for the same documents it's like everybody forgets I, I don't know Jamel why would you serve uh, just for anything that might get that might have gotten missed oh there are always the secret hiding places that safe that has something um, in a different building that you don't know of and that's I mean, that's the reason you, you would do it. Um, wh one thing I wanted to just mention, uh, Judge Wood also made, uh, made a remark about the, the attorneys that were going to be doing the review. And I think that that's, that's an important distinction. Um, you know, she said, I, I, I have a view about contract attorneys and associates, and sometimes they could look at a document and not know, you know, the document from another. And so you might be better served putting more senior lawyers on this to get this done right and efficiently. And I think that that's something for folks to consider as a, when we're talking about these types of high level, high profile, sort of bet the company or bet the law firm reviews. Um, I've even known Rick Dean to be stuck in a priv review on a matter because the client deems it that, that important. And so you might wanna think about who's actually doing the uh, parallel priv review uh, if you're working with a, a taint team so that they can actually have that conversation um, if need be. I, I think I saw Tiffany, you had a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tiffany Simmons. I'm here in Atlanta. Um, I wanted to go back to what Mark was speaking about when he talked about the phones and the technology and subpoenas. Um, with the technology, you know, changing so quickly and rapidly, um, what do you see the government doing to address um, the privacy issues with phones and technology? I mean, do you see that it's going to be um, more, I guess, uh, consumer helpful, or is it going to be where we have to look to a Facebook to not release our information? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it's, it's really interesting because a lot of, you know, let's, let's, let's be frank, like if this was a server, each app was a different application or a piece of data, uh, many of them today um, are built, you know, there's ones out there that no one can get into the, uh, besides the client, you know, the government or whomever. Um, some of the forensic equipment won't even, you know, image them or, or capture that information. So um, I, where I think I see it going is that more to the cloud, like even the device will become irrelevant and the data will live in the cloud and um, it will come down to the provider who will be the one to, um, uh, to actually provide the information. So while the, the government may get this device and image it, you know, certain aspects of it, certain apps, certain pieces of data will be complete brick to them. Um, and it will be dependent on either the subject or the target of the investigation or the service provider behind that app uh, or the developer of that app to, to help the government or maybe even uh, the, the Taint team get into it to review the contents.
Yeah. Yeah, Sandy. Gary, why don't we start with you? And, and before we do that, I want to ask, I want to follow up, and you're the co-chair of the large New, uh, the large New York firm. How does this idea that Judge Wood had about having senior lawyers do it fit with your business model? Uh, that, that, that was a joke. That was a rhetorical <laughs> uh, yeah, what, what, who, who, should, who, should, who should pay for this? Look, um, look I, I think it's, if you're dealing with a large public company, right, uh, then I think it's kind of a moot issue because they're going to be investing so much resources into the defense of the case or the defense of the investigation that a sharing of the cost doesn't seem like, it seems more hypothetical than a real problem. Yeah, but if you're dealing with a lawyer who's a single practitioner or a small law firm or the like, uh, it does seem that the government really ought to bear the burden there uh, I think that, uh, in my case, in the Stewart case, where I got involved after the judge had made the ruling, or he actually was before he made the ruling, he, he asked me if I would do it, because he put, he put in the ruling that he had appointed me, but uh, it was after he had made the decision. I think there probably was some concern there, because look, you know, one, it was a, the, 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 the search in Stewart was controversial. Because she was a, you know, she was a very, you know, political left-wing political person who was very anti-government, tied in with uh, the sheikh, the Egyptian sheikh, and he was sort of representing him and allegedly very close to him in, in the terrorist activities. Uh, and but it, 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 the, the case itself had caused fractures in the, in the criminal defense community about the appropriateness of because it was a search, Stewart. Share, Stewart was an active criminal defense lawyer, and she shared space with four other criminal defense lawyers. So when the agents came in and seized computers at Al, they seized everything. So uh, you had the issue there of the, the people who were not involved in the case, their materials were in the hands of the government. And you also had the issue in that case, which seemed to me that so I was always surprised even, even, you know, when I got involved after, and why the government fought it so hard. Because, you know, Stewart, you know, you, no matter how good a taint team you're going to put on it, how do you know that none of the people on that taint team are ever going to have anything to do with any of the other cases or representations? <coughs> whatever stage they're in that Stewart had, or any of the other people had. And they sh really shouldn't be exposed to that. I would have thought from the government's point of view, they would have been better off, you know, putting, you know, this hot potato in, in some independent person's hands. But, you know, I think the case, there was a lot of heat between the defense and the government in, in the case, at least on the substance. Although, actually, uh, what was interesting about it was the people, the lawyers on both sides that I dealt with on the ta on the taint on the privilege issues, they were really totally professional and got along really very well, even in a controversial case. It yeah. was, and it really went very smoothly. Yeah, and Rob, if I could just follow up on that and on the cost of these things, right, of a taint team or review. You mentioned the um, the technology assisted review and. I just want to make sure, like, I, I've seen this both in the government and the private sector. While, yes, there's, uh, you know, technology certain, can certainly assist in the review and reduce the cost and the time frames. Make no mistake, it, there, I've never seen anything that fully automates the process, right? I mean, as you all know, anyone's dealt with e-discovery, you know, put in the search term attorney and, you know, and see what comes back. Uh, there's going to be a lot of time spent 
while it's quicker than manually, manually reviewing everything, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of time and costs associated with um, ensuring that you know, there's no false positives that are missed or, or vice versa. Um, so it certainly can reduce the pool of documents or um, uh, evidence that needs to be reviewed, um, but there certainly has to be some manual effort to say, yeah, this is a false positive or this isn't. So, so I wanna go down the line and then, I'm, and then we'll ask questions right after, answer questions right after that. And, and my question for you, I'm gonna start with you, Dan, is, on, on is, is the Cohen model, what was done there, which is some hybrid of techni te uh, technical, technologically assisted review and use of a special master at considerable expense, um, though probably could have been worse, all done in four months. Is that gonna, be, gonna become a model for the future? And, and I ask you to think about that versus just simply agreeing to a taint team or not asking for anything and take your chances on a motion to suppress if your client gets indicted and you go to trial. What, what, what sort of trend do you see, uh, and I know it'll vary from case to case, but what sort of trends do you see? And then I'd ask, go down the line. No, no, I, I think if you've got the money, that would be the trend. I don't think you can expect that you're gonna get it all done in four months. I really don't, that's, that's ridiculous. That, but that was ridiculously fast, and so, I, I don't know. I still go to, they, they should do it together, and I'm, I'm, what if there is one, my concern is what if there's this one or two document in there? What's the defense attorney supposed to do? Maybe it's subject to the crime fraud exception. Just highlight the one document? I don't know. I might leave it buried in the one million. Mark, what do you think? Um, I, I think, uh, and I picked up this term from one of the cases I read in this area is, um, back to that Blake case I mentioned, that limited, limited um, uh, or called one of those search warrants unconstitutional. The whole idea was it was to reduce the government's, and this term, I love it, exploratory rummaging. Um, and let me uh, speak to that, because if you think of a physical traditional search warrant, and look, I was involved in them as well, you go into someone's house, you're, you're seizing the warrant, and then it's hard to say like, wow, look at the tools this guy has. You wanna go play with them, but you can't. You're a professional, you're there to execute what is in the warrant. I think now we're in this digital age where those same controls have to be in place. We talked a little bit about technology that'll enable that, but absolutely we're in a world where um, I think this will be the norm. Hey, have forward. you ever gone to court to explain to a magistrate judge or a judge the technology? It's one thing I worry about is our, 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 our judges aren't equipped to understand what they need to understand to draw the right lines. Uh, yes, uh, especially magistrate judges, and look, I, I won't n mention any of them by names, but when I first started doing this, I remember the first search warrant I did, the judge said, well, I don't know what the hell this means, but it sounds pretty bad, and I think we're beyond that today. <laughs> I think we're beyond that. I think, I think the courts are very educated um, and know much more than what an IP address is and, and network traffic and everything else, so I, th I think it, we are definitely getting there. Jamil, what do you think? I, um, I'm concerned if we're going down the path where lawyers and law firms are going to be the subject of more and more raids, or raids, right? Um, but a, a couple of things that I think about, one is document retention and, and, and needing to focus uh, that and put that on the forefront. And the other thing is this sort of um, going back to the Gates memo from, from years ago that not a lot of what we have in our files is actually privileged. Right? Um, some things are just facts and sort of trying to parse out how we practice and, and, and where we store the things that are truly privileged versus those things that are, are um, facts or just reports that we might have already disclosed to the government or some other third party in a different way. And so just thinking about how we practice, if we're talking just specifically about the law firms perhaps being subject to, uh, to more warrants going forward. To, just to pick up on one thing you said about um, document retention. I've, I, I'd like to represent small companies, and I do so from time to time, and I find that they often have more documents than the big companies because they haven't invested in, in, in proper management of their documents, and it's, it, that's one reason it gets so wildly expensive. Gary, what do you think the trends are? Well, the, uh, you, you know, one just uh, anecdotally, you know, what's interesting is uh, on the special master front, most courts deny it. I mean, that's been history. And uh, one of the interesting things I thought kind of humorously was Barbara Jones wrote an opinion when she was on the court in a case called U.S. Against Grant in which she poo-pooed the, the notion of there being a special master and denied the application for it. And they cited, the, the, the defendant in that case cited the Lynn Stewart case. Oh, that, that's just because she was a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, the, uh, my sense is 
because I think it cut, what happened here cuts two ways. One, look, everything involving President Trump and Michael Cohen is sui generis, right? At the same time, it does have a precedential impact, and I think the fact that it happened here is a precedent now for more special masters, either full bore or hybrid, uh, than before, because I think it's another case to point to, and I think more courts will probably allow it. You know, you know, one of the things about what's privileged and what isn't privileged, you know, I have a more, maybe a perhaps, uh, you know, uh, people vary as what's work product. You know, it's, it's, off, it's easy to know what's attorney-client communication, right? Or at least it's easier. But work product is, uh, you know, how you compile your information, what you do with it, how you organize it, what you select. I have always took of the view that that's classic work, attorney work product. And would a taint team or someone be very uh, uh, sensitive to that? I doubt it, right? I think they would take a, uh, so I think, and I think that lawyers, work product may in many ways be much more important and much more sensitive than actual pure attorney-client communications. I had a question in the back there. Look, I, I think, like all things, I think making sure that we're careful, uh, you know, putting aside this issue, putting aside just general, uh, labeling things as, you know, attorney-client privilege, attorney-client work product, making sure we have all, that we've, you know, checked off all the boxes to make sure that we've protected our papers and our documents and our client files, I think uh, just seems to me to be really important, and I think it's really important, particularly in the day, in this age of emails. People just dash off emails so willy-nilly, right? Without thinking, and, and no matter how much people, no matter how many horror stories we all hear, experience, read about, people are so careless with emails, just so careless, right? Other questions? Mark, and are, should lawyers be worried about um, hacking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should. And, um, and yeah. what, 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 what can we do? No, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it very much so, and look, it, that's a, it's obviously a whole other conversation, but, um, you know, the adversaries that are out there, um, if they're trying to get to client A, they may try, 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 but if they can't get to client A, they can, oh, I can easily get to client A's attorney or to client A's vendor who has unfettered access to their network. So, absolutely, um, you know, it's not just, you know, your information, it's your client's information. That we all know the classic stories, all the major data breaches of the third party vendor or the, you know, um, the, the law firm that was the, the source of the major data breach. So um, law firms and other third party vendors, of course, in the services industry are more and more becoming huge targets for advanced, um, you know, cyber adversaries. Are, are you in that business of advising uh, lawyers on how to prevent uh, attacks or is that well, yes, I, that was not a uh, no, planned question, but I'm curious. Yes, yes, absolutely. One of our sponsors, yeah. by the way, Nardell. No. Yes, I mean anyone. <laughs> and uh, but to Gary's point, <laughs> no, I'm not. Yeah, that was, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to bite on it. But for anyone, law firms or anyone, email to Gary's point. Email is, and I'm just seeing it in in everyday data breaches, is like the top vector. It is just the absolute magnet for people on the good side putting information in the email that shouldn't be there and for the bad guys targeting it to try to get in as a foothold. So um, that is the biggest threat. If I had to leave you with one thing that is your biggest threat, it is your email environment, probably from a law firm perspective. Uh, 
So, so my mentor, Brendan Sullivan, used to say it was the criminal mind that would keep us in business for our careers. He now thinks it's email that would keep us in business for the rest, rest of our careers. Well, I, you know, sorry not to keep talking here, but the one that I think, I think just like email came, I think it's going to go away. I, there already are companies, you may know, that don't use email at all. They use things like Slack or, you know, even just uh, Signal and text messages. Uh, it's, it'd be hard, but if you think about it, if you start your company with a culture of that of never having email um, you know, or a one central email for external communications, um, again, I don't, I don't want to digress too much, but uh, I think at some point, for the most part, email will become a thing of the past long, down the road. Rob? Yeah, I, I just, uh, just to follow up on that and, and one point in response to the question I was asked, years ago I represented a law firm uh, in, in which was uh, involved in the, some issues, um, and one of the problems was the associates' timesheets. There were some terrible things that the, an associate put in his or her timesheets about checked into this as to whether or not it's pro proper, not sure that this is okay to do. I, I thought to myself, what am I being faced with some law school exam here? How do I? I mean, you know, and it, it was just, it, and they went on like this page after page of these time entries which were, uh, you know, I, I think that, that people's ability to engage in self-destructive activities is boundless. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to go, uh, let's assume your client's been indicted and it's now time for discovery in a case. And uh, you're asking for your discovery from the government. And uh, they um, have a collection of uh, data that was reviewed by the Tate team and turned over to the prosecution team. And then there's also the, the stuff that was not turned over to the prosecution team. Uh, as a defense lawyer, Danny, are you going to ask for, for both, and are you going to get both? And do you want both? As a practical matter, get yes and yes. I mean, how do you know what's not? Yes, it's, it's, you're going to do your own search. On the bigger cases, everybody's on the same kind of platform looking at stuff. Right, so you want, I would say yes, everything, because you don't know what you're missing. And Jamila, do you think you'll have success getting the that which has not been uh, turned over to the prosecution team and only reviewed by the Taint team? Oh, we should um, for for a host of reasons. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking here that if you have potential Brady, um, which might might be good for you, but also you don't know if you are going to assert um, you know a good faith a, a, attorney a, attorney defense. And so, if you've got an advice of client defense and it, by the counsel defense and you need all of the privileged materials and you later decide you're going to waive that, there's, there's only one way for you to figure that out and so you've got to have that, you've got to have that other information. Has anybody encountered a situation where the government has said, well, we may have gotten all this stuff, I, let's say it's a law firm and there are other law firm clients implicated in the data that you're asking for and they say, but it's really none of your business to, to, to have that because it's, it's completely unrelated. Has anybody dealt with that situation? I, I have not. But I could see it. I could see it happen. The government really shouldn't have the rights to do that. It's your client's property, right? It's your. It, it belongs to your client. Your client should certainly have a right to get their papers oh, back. I, I guess I mean, I'm positing something that happened to, the, say, third-party discovery. Yeah. By the way, I agree. If it's your, if it's your own own stuff, I think you're entitled to it under the federal rules. But if it's, let's say, it came from a third, but let's say it came from Google. Or Yahoo, which which is we're going to see more and more of that. I think. Hank, did you have this happen in your case? Where's Hank? Um, David Bouchard and Hank just had a trial. They had this as an issue in their case with the third party privilege, and I'm not sure how it worked out. How they uh, saw it. It yeah. worked out fairly well for us. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. That's lovely, isn't it? In a trial and somebody standing up in the gallery to object. 
So uh, this is last last question, and uh, let's do a lightning round starting with you, Danny. And the question is um, predictions for the future. And I'll give you one uh, to answer. Will the U.S. Supreme Court decide the constitutionality or the legality of taint teams within the next five years or not? And if you'd rather give another prediction, uh, either that one or something else you'd like to give about the future in this area. I say no, because the because what is the what's the alternative? I don't think it's going to be addressed. Mark, definitely got to plead the fifth on that one. Not being a lawyer, but I will say that I think some of the, again the technology that um, the government uses to prove a case, I think, can be used by de, uh, in in defense as well to say, hey, we can prove that the government did or didn't review that based on the, the concept of the same team, uh, the taint team concept that we've been discussing. Right, that's an interesting point, that, that there's actually the ability to look at, if we know to ask, to look in the data you know to ask. And, that's right. and determine yeah. what the government's looked at and what they haven't. That's right. I, I'm sure that, that we I'm, need to hire you to do that, right? No, <laughs> I swear to you, we did not pay <laughs> the Janella, what do you think? I think Gary and I are going to take up this issue about having all law enforcement agents recused from further matters after participating in searches. So that's probably what you'll see in the next seven years. <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> so, so my, my personal view is that it's not going to happen unless somebody fights fights him on this and takes it up, and it could come up in a suppression motion, I suppose as well. And um, and uh, we'll, we'll see. But the Supreme Court has not addressed this issue, and most circuit courts have not addressed this issue. And there's there's a lot of litigation uh, going forward. Uh, thanks, thanks for everybody. Thanks for this great panel, and uh, thanks for listening.